let's finish chapter four. Uh, what I'd like to talk about right now is reference states and reference values. So all these properties that we're dealing with, they're all taken at a reference state, right? Now, uh, the reference state uh, has to be given a value of zero somewhere because we can calculate what these uh, values are, um, but uh, knowing where they are equal to zero in certain locations is important. Now, the reference state that we're going to be using for water is 0 0.01 Celsius, and for refrigerant, uh, 134A, uh, it's going to be minus 40 degrees Celsius. Now, you may see some negative properties based on this reference state, but don't pay attention to that necessarily. What we are going to be doing and what's important in our thermodynamics analysis is typically the difference between two states. So when we take into account or we look at these values, we're looking at really the difference between two states of interest. And that is what will give us the result that we are looking for whenever we por perform our analysis. So um, keep in mind, though, that when you're looking at these values, these are relative values to a reference state. So that's why you may see a negative internal energy uh, pop up somewhere uh, on these charts. Now, another thing I would like to introduce is the ideal gas law. And more broadly, we can start with discussion in equation of state. And the most popular equation of state, and equation of state I mean something that relates pressure, temperature, and uh, specific volumes of something. The most popular one is the ideal gas equation. You can write it a bunch of different ways. But it says that the pressure times the volume of a gas is equal to the ideal gas constant times the absolute temperature. And the ideal gas constant can be calculated by using the universal gas constant, which we can use for all gases. It's 8.314 kilojoules or joules or kilojoules per kilomole degree K divided by the molecular weight of the substance. So if we're dealing with nitrogen, so N2, we would take 8.314 kilojoules per kilomole degree K. We divide it by 28 to get the ideal gas constant for that particular gas. We can write the ideal gas equation in several different ways. Uh, you can substitute in mass. So here we uh, had a specific volume uh, expressed in this equation. So it's P times, I, I think I said earlier it was volume, but it's actually specific volume. We can also write it as pressure times volume equals mass times the ideal gas constant times absolute temperature. Um, we can write it as pressure times volume equals the amount of moles times the universal gas constant. So we can just write it several different types of ways uh, to express the relationship for an ideal gas. Now, a question I'd like you to think about is how we treat water vapor as an ideal gas. Or how do we treat, let's say, uh, something that has a, a very low temperature. Let's say we have air at uh, minus 100 degrees Celsius. Is that applicable to treat air as an ideal gas at minus 100 degrees Celsius? Is it applicable to treat water as an ideal gas? When is it applicable? Can we do it when the qual it has a certain quality to it? So think about that. Do can we do that? Well, let me answer that question. So this graph is showing a temperature specific volume TV diagram of uh, water, okay? And here you see our saturation dome and uh, our lines of constant pressure. So the, the answer to that question is that it's all relative. So depending on the fluid that we're using, we're going to be able to prescribe the ideal gas law equations to it. Now, what is not appropriate is 
if you calculate the state of something and it's a saturated liquid, cannot use the ideal gas equation to calculate properties for a saturated liquid. Okay? It has to be in gaseous form. Now, what this graph is showing is at different locations, it has provided us with the amount of error that is um, found if we look at the values that are found in the table and we look at the use of the ideal gas equation. And you'll see that in the right hand side here of our graph, this pink section, this is an ideal gas applicable range because the values of error are typically less than 1% over here. As we move further, so as we increase the pressure up to the critical pressure of water or whatever fluid we're dealing with, or we inc increase it to the critical temperature if we're looking at it in that way, we would no longer be able to apply the ideal gas equation here. So you see as we move towards higher pressures, we can no longer use the ideal gas assumption because the errors become unacceptably high. So in order to determine if something is, uh, if we can use the ideal gas equation, if you're concerned about it at a certain location, we can calculate reduced temperatures and reduced pressures. Now at what a reduced temperature and a reduced pressure is, is we compare the particular pressure the fluid is at to the critical pressure or the critical temperature of that fluid. And we defined critical pressures and temperatures in a previous lecture. So if the ratio between those two, so let's say the, crit the pressure and the critical pressure, we'll call that the reduced pressure. If the reduced pressure is much less than one, we can say that a, the, the gas behaves as an ideal gas regardless of what the temperature is. And that happens here below 10,000 kilopascals for water. So in this region here, below 10,000 kilopascals, we can be, treat all of this uh, vapor over here as an ideal gas. Now at high temperatures, so at, at a ratio between the temperature and the critical temperature, at a reduced temperature above two, we can assume ideal gas behavior with very good accuracy regardless of the pressure, except when the reduced pressure is much greater than one. And we have to be very careful as we approach this critical point to realize that the ideal gas behavior no longer applies near this location. So I hope you guys got a good overview of chapter four. It's a lot of material, but it really forms kind of the core of what we're gonna be dealing with in the next few chapters. And as you go into your next class, you'll be dealing with a lot of these different types of properties. So I encourage you to get good at studying this and learning this uh, material and practicing it.